The musty smell in the waiting room did nothing to ease the nausea in my stomach. I looked around and then stared at my feet again, wondering what I was doing here. To my left sat my beautiful wife Rachel, looking as dazzling as ever, with a beauty that never left me without butterflies in my stomach. To the right sat my daughter Jasmine, who in many ways was my salvation. My thoughts went back to the day I met each of them. I was a completely different person then. Mr. Green, a voice said, bringing me back to reality. We will be ready in twenty minutes. Another witness has just come to the stand. I nodded. This will be the first time in a year that I will see my ex-wife face to face. The woman I was married to for twelve years, but a lot has changed since then. I'll start with the day my life changed forever. It was a normal spring day in Albany, New York. I was returning home from work at a local utility company in Albany. I hated the job and was basically forced into it by Jessica, my ex-wife. It's more reliable and financially profitable, she said. It's better than construction, she usually added. I should have realized sooner that all she cared about was money and social status. I don't want to say much about Jessica other than that at 35 years old, she was still the most beautiful girl in the world to me. She was smart, funny, and loved me to death from the moment we met. I always thought she was not on my level. I was working in construction in my hometown of the Bronx when we met. I was tall and quite attractive, with a permanent tan from being outside all the time. From the moment we started dating, we were always together. I was her protector, her entertainer, and she paid no attention to my lack of academic knowledge, but only loved me with even greater passion. When she finished her master's degree, we moved back to her hometown of Albany and eventually got married. Her parents weren't happy with me, oh no, and they didn't hide their dislike. Both they and her old friends thought she was too good for me and wondered why she had married a man below her level. To her father, I was a handsome idiot. However, we were happy and loved each other more than anything in the world. I was an only child and my parents died in my early twenties, so Jessica became my whole world. I got a job in construction and Jessica got a very good job at a finance company owned by a friend of her father. When the recession hit in 2008, I lost my job, and it was Jessica's salary that got us through the tough times. This only made her parents hate me more, if that was even possible. This created tension in our marriage. Well, I think it's natural when the people you love and hang out with say that your husband is a loser. Unfortunately, it also took a toll on my friendships back home in the Bronx. In their opinion, I now moved in other circles. Of course, my best friend Joey was always there for me. He was more than a brother, and his parents helped me get through the loss of my parents. It was Jessica who convinced me to take a job at the utility company. Like I said, I hated her. Indoors, computers, talking to people on the phone with a fake voice, it was my personal hell, but I tried for Jessica and for us. We both hoped to have children one day, but a successful career and the appearance of success was more important to Jessica. I didn't care about image, wealth, or status, but I did everything Jessica wanted and even tried to become the person she wanted me to be. Unfortunately, when you stop being yourself, Everything goes wrong and you end up becoming an unhappy person. I was no longer the fun-loving construction worker from the Bronx who loved to have fun and interact with people. I became depressed most days, I gained weight, stopped taking care of myself, and rarely, if ever, socialized. Yes, I became an overweight office worker married to a successful financial analyst who attended lavish dinners and cocktail parties with Albany's elite. I was not one of them. They knew it, and I knew it. I drove up to our house and was surprised to see Jessica's car in the garage. I got out of the car and headed towards the house with a feeling of impending fear. I didn't know why, but when I walked into the kitchen, Jessica was sitting at the table, looking serious but confident. There were some papers in front of her, and when I was about to speak, she interrupted me. Mikey, we need to talk. Those famous words hit me like a ton of bricks. I could see that she was a little nervous, but when I sat down, I didn't see any tears. What happened, dear? I asked. Everything is fine. She gathered her courage, cleared her throat, as if preparing for a big speech. I'm sorry, Michael, but I want a divorce, 
she stated clearly and calmly. My heart sank and my stomach churned. I was speechless, as if someone had grabbed my heart and ripped it out. This terrible feeling of sudden loss, which I have experienced twice already, is the worst feeling imaginable. It permeates your body like a virus. I looked at her and asked in a trembling voice, WWY. I fell in love with someone else, she said, looking at me without any regret. I was crushed, but strangely I wasn't shocked. The old Mikey Green would have caused chaos, but he no longer existed. Jessica made sure of that. I was a shell of the man I once was, and now she ends me with the final blow of the sword. How long? I said hoarsely. Four months, she replied as I just looked at her. But now I want us to be together and get married, she stated without the slightest concern for my feelings. I was looking at a woman I no longer recognized, and looking back, she was looking at a man she no longer recognized. I don't want to know the details, but I want to know why, I finally said, afraid to hear the answer. She didn't hesitate to answer. Just look at you, Mikey. You are not the man I married. You've gotten fat, you haven't shaved for years, and when was the last time you got a proper haircut or bought new clothes, she said, as if she was letting out long, pent-up feelings. You're a shell of the person I fell in love with, and let's be honest, you were never on my intellectual level, were you? She said mockingly. God, how many times over the last decade have I had to defend you in front of my parents, friends, and colleagues? Explain to them why we got married in the first place, she continued, and I suddenly wondered where the girl I fell in love with had gone to, and who this heartless creature in front of me was. And rich. I mean, my new man is younger than you, fit, attractive, and has a successful business and a big house next to mom and dad in Loudon Villa. Every new word she uttered felt like a dagger stabbing into my body. I know him? I asked quietly. He owns a gardening company operating in the area. He is the only owner for now, but we want to expand the business together, she added, and I remained silent. She finally finished and just sat there waiting for another question, no doubt to ruin me even more. When I remained silent, she slid the papers towards me. Dad and his lawyer helped me draw up our divorce papers. I think this is a good deal for you. Considering that I paid off most of the mortgage, Dad offered to split the house 70 thirtieths in my favor, which we could sell since I would be moving in with Rich. I just looked at her, and she continued. I think a 50 50th split of our savings is fair, and I won't ask for alimony, although I could fight for something if I wanted. The arrogance and malice in her voice were now obvious to me. How did I miss this all these years? I felt like a fool, and I guess she thought I always had been. Let's be honest, Mikey, I make a lot more than you, and my new man makes enough too, so I won't touch your 401k as long as you sign the papers and don't fight me over anything, she suddenly stopped. When I looked her straight in the eyes, she must have seen a glimpse of the old Mikey because she gulped. I took a pen and signed the papers that destroyed 12 years of marriage. I got up from the table, went to our bedroom, collected my things, and returned. She was sitting at her desk, going through paperwork, when I walked past her, through the door, and out of her life. She said that. Joey shouted. Is she crazy? To me, Joey is my family, and unfortunately, I have neglected him over the past few years. But as true brothers, we can forgive any offense and will always be there for you in difficult times. While we were discussing what happened, I heard someone in the background and Joey was trying to calm them down. Is this Helen? I asked. What does she say? Yes, Mikey, she said it was good that they got rid of that arrogant bitch. Joey and Helen had no filters. What you see is what you get, and God, how I missed that. This is how I used to be. Hey, Mikey, I have this guy Helen knows who does debt investigations for local companies. I can ask him to find out about this guy for you. You know, check to see if he's a scammer, he asked in his usual rude manner. I don't care, buddy. I said sadly. This guy is cheating on you, stealing your wife, and you just sit back. Damn, Mikey, she really turned you into a cuckold, he said, raising voice. Damn, that hurt, and Joey must have realized that too. Sorry, brother, 
I'm just mad as hell, and I want you to be too, he said apologetically. It's okay, Joey. I mean, you're right and all. Do what you want, I said. I gave him some information I had about the new guy. He was a gardener in the area, so it wasn't difficult to find more information if Helen's man wanted. You need to get back in shape, Mikey, and be yourself again, he instructed before we finally hung up. After I hung up, I lay down on the cheap motel bed and stared at the spinning ceiling fan. My head was spinning, and I was trying to comprehend everything that had happened in my life, not just in the last few hours, but in the last twelve years. Sleep wouldn't come to me, so I reached for the bottle of Jack Daniels on the table and drank straight from the bottle. I did the same for the next few weeks. I would often call work that I was sick or show up drunk and smelling of alcohol, and they would send me home. Everyone in the office looked at me, gloated behind my back, and it seemed to me that I was looking at myself from the outside, simply existing. I was recommended to see a doctor, and although that helped, I was released from work, given more time to think and think about the past. I never made it to the Jones and Brown office to finalize my divorce. The letter was sent to my office because no one knew where I was and no one was going to look, that's for sure. The letter contained a divorce agreement and a check for $175,000. This was my share of the house, savings and contents of the house. The agreement confirmed everything Jessica had said in the kitchen, and since I did not show up for the meeting, it was completed in my absence. I had no idea if this was all legal, but I didn't have the strength to fight. Not enough to stand up to Jessica and her powerful circle. It's been a month since Jessica told me she wanted a divorce, and I finally cashed the check into my account. I discovered that all of our other accounts had been closed and Jessica had removed her name from our joint account. However, I was walking aimlessly out of the bank when I heard a voice calling my name. I ignored him at first, but when I finally turned around, I saw Pete and Shelley, our old neighbors. Hey, Michael, Pete asked, approaching me. Sorry to hear about the divorce, he said nervously. Now Shelley, his wife, she was a nosy neighbor and loved to gossip, and it didn't take long before she got involved. I can't believe Jessica left you and got married so quickly. I looked at her in surprise. I seemed to remember Jessica saying she wanted to marry this guy, but my mind was so foggy at the time that I forgot about it. Oh, you didn't know? Shelley continued. I had no idea, I said indifferently. We thought you and Jessica were a real couple, said Peter. And then we saw that she married Richard Walton. This was the first time I heard his full name. But when I looked at Shelley, she seemed to wince and blush at the very mention of his name. I ignored it because I suddenly realized that I now had a last name that I could give to my friend Joey, and not just Rich Gardner from Albany. He was a gardener who services your area, I said, offering unsolicited information. As I said this, Peter turned around and looked at Shelley, who was now bright red. Our gardener, he shouted at Shelley, attracting the glances of passers-by. Why are you blushing, Shelley? he asked, and I realized that I was in trouble. No, Peter, no, never, Shelley begged. He tried with me once, and I put him in his place. Peter was now also blushing and looking rather annoyed as Shelley continued. He's a scoundrel, and every time he's supposed to come, I leave for a few hours to avoid him. I never told you because I knew you'd be angry, she said, grabbing his hand and pleading. We need to talk, he said before turning to me and apologizing. He grabbed her hand and pulled her down the sidewalk. I guess that's one lost client for Jessica and Richard in their growing empire, I thought, finally smiling for the first time in a long time. The news of the wedding hit me hard. I became depressed again and reached for the bottle. I thought I'd try drinking myself to death. This way, all the pain will disappear and I won't have to continue my meaningless existence. The next morning I got out of my motel bed and fell on the floor, vomiting. I've hit rock bottom. I crawled into the shower on all fours and let the cold water wash over me. When I came out, I looked in the mirror and what I saw amazed me. Damn you, I shouted at the person looking at me in the reflection. I need to become better. I fell to my knees and cried for the first time since my mother died. 
I just want to be happy, I screamed into my hands. I knew something had to change. On Monday, I went to my office and started working. For some reason, my personal mail ended up on my desk, probably redirected there because no one knew where I lived. While I was browsing through what was mostly spam, I found a flyer for a local gym promising to get anyone in shape in 12 weeks. I chuckled, thinking it would take longer. But I thought, what the hell? Maybe this is just the change I need. Walking into the gym that night, I had no idea what this beautiful young instructor would think of me, an old loser. At 38, I felt like an 80-year-old man, but as I came closer to her, she extended her gentle hand, which I willingly accepted. I'm Jasmine, she said. To say she thought I was a wreck would be an understatement. But in her beautiful brown eyes, I saw hope for myself. They seemed to infuse energy into me. Not attraction or anything romantic, but honesty and compassion. So over the next week, I moved out of the motel and signed a lease for a small studio in town and next to the gym. I decided to focus on my 12-week plan and see where life takes me. I needed to lose about 50 pounds, and the best place to start was to get rid of all unpacked bottles of alcohol among my things. I worked hard for the next month. My life consisted only of work and the gym. Joey and Helen also visited me a few times, probably more to check on me than for other reasons, but by the end of the month, and with Jasmine's constant encouragement, I had already lost 14 pounds. The good thing about being in the gym almost every day was that I got to know Jasmine better. She agreed to coffee one evening after my workout, and I learned a little about her life. She grew up with a single mother and attended local college to become a full-time fitness trainer and nutritionist. She really knew her stuff, and I became even more attached to her. I told her about my recent divorce and my former life in the Bronx. I admitted to her that I had hit rock bottom before joining the gym and meeting her. I tried not to sound like a desperate pervert, but she was incredibly compassionate and emotionally mature. Not even a few classes later, I came out of the shower and met her, and I was stunned. Jasmine was talking to a woman who at first glance looked like her sister, corny I know, but it's true. Jasmine saw me looking and came towards me before I could turn around and walk away. Michael, this is my mom Rachel, she said, smiling as Rachel extended her hand. Our eyes met and I felt a wave of embarrassment. My stomach churned and I really didn't know what to say. The silence became awkward. It means you like him, Mom, Jasmine said, laughing and saving me in the process. He is silent when he likes someone, she added, as if she had known me all her life. The truth is that I was not always a quiet, shy, and inconspicuous person. Years of what I now consider emotional abuse have taken their toll. Jasmine left us to get her things and Rachel, and I started talking. When Jasmine returned, she invited me to dinner across the street. I was hesitant at first, but her persistence made refusal impossible. I assumed that if she had a father, she would have him wrapped around her little finger. Rachel was so warm and sweet at dinner. I could tell the apple didn't fall far from the tree, and as the evening progressed, I relaxed in their company. There was no need to pretend or be pretentious with them. These were not people who considered themselves better than others. Rachel joked a lot, and it relaxed me. We briefly touched on our past, and I guessed that Jasmine had told her mother about my life. I left that evening feeling better than I had in months, even years. I even had Rachel's number in my phone after she agreed, or rather insisted, to finally fix my hair. At first I was reluctant, but once Rachel became a stylist, I gave up. This brought out the sweetest laugh I have ever heard from a woman. Over the next couple of months, Rachel and I were inseparable. When we finally made love, from then on there was only her in my heart, and finally it began to beat for another woman. We knew we had to go slow because I didn't want her to think she was Jessica's replacement. We wanted to make sure our feelings for each other were real. We had both been hurt in our lives and so trust was very important to both of us. I ended up bringing her back to my hometown where Joey and Helen immediately fell in love with her. Helen called me aside one evening in the kitchen and said, That's the woman for you, Mikey. Don't let her go. I assured her that this was impossible. Really, 
I don't believe you. 180 pounds. Really? I said excitedly. Yes, exactly 180, Jasmine confirmed. You're back to your ideal weight, Daddy, she said, laughing at her new nickname for me. I was so proud of myself and so grateful to Jasmine and Rachel for helping me get to this point. My new haircut, along with giving up my beard, must also have contributed to my weight loss, I thought. Rachel convinced me to try the clean-shaven look one day so she could see my face. I had to laugh at that suggestion. I just hoped she wouldn't be disappointed by the man behind the mask. Luckily she wasn't. So I was in seventh heaven. I felt like a weight had been lifted from my shoulders. I achieved what I wanted, looked great and felt great, and that was the mindset I had when I was working construction in New York. I walked towards Rachel's house feeling on top of the world. I walked through the door and saw Rachel looking nervous and pale. The look of concern on her face gave me a feeling of deja vu. What happened, dear? I asked nervously, feeling that bad feeling again. We need to talk, she said. Suddenly, I felt the walls closing in. Those familiar feelings returned and nausea overtook my senses. Okay, I said as Rachel took my hand and sat me down. Look, Rachel, if you're going to break up with me, just do it quickly so I can get out of here, I said sharply, and she backed away. Ula was shocked. No, darling, she answered, squeezing my hand tighter and pulling me a little closer. I don't know how to say this because I don't want you to get angry with me. My feelings of anxiety did not decrease. I'm pregnant, she announced cautiously. I was shocked. We were silent for several seconds and her beautiful face wrinkled, trying to understand my reaction. I got to my feet and walked away a few steps. Then I turned to her looking worried and on the verge of tears. Hooray! I shouted at the top of my voice, simultaneously jumping in the air with my fists raised. Her face brightened and joy returned to her eyes. Are not you angry? She asked, regaining her beautiful smile. How can I be angry? I'll become a dad. I announced, hugging her and kissing her. We hugged and didn't let go of each other for the next five minutes. I was the happiest person on earth. Over the next few days, Rachel, Jasmine, and I began house hunting. Even though Rachel had little savings, I had almost $180,000 in my bank account, which was more than enough to buy a house without a mortgage. In less than a week, we found a beautiful five-bedroom colonial home in Pine Hills. It needed some work, which put other buyers off, but with my experience in construction, I was excited about its potential. Our offer was accepted, and we did not have to take out a mortgage. The day we moved into our new home, I got down on one knee and proposed to Rachel. I knew it was quick, but I loved her so much and knew she was mine. She agreed, and I would like to say that from that point on we lived happily ever after, but that would miss the reason why I am sitting here in court. To be clear, I was not accused of anything. Well, a couple of weeks after we moved into our new house, I got a call from Joey. It was shocking, to say the least. I had completely forgotten about Joey's request to Helen's colleague to investigate my ex-wife's new husband, and frankly, neither had Joey. If it had lasted a few months, I would have no idea what it was costing me, and frankly, I wouldn't care. However, Joey was overjoyed and just had to tell me his findings. I was silent while Joey spoke. It's all a house of cards, Mikey, he said, laughing. Helen's boyfriend did some digging, and after you gave us the full name, the process began. It turned out that the IRS and the feds got involved. Wait, what? I shouted, thinking I had missed a big chunk of the story. What do you mean the feds got involved? Just listen, Mikey, just listen, he said, trying to calm me down. The gardening company he owns is registered to Jessica as a director, and she's in debt, Mikey, seriously in debt, and that's just the beginning. The house he owns is now in Jessica's name and is worth over a million dollars, but the mortgage payments are made through a company called Rich Well Enterprises. This company owns a home and a business. Jessica and Richard are registered as joint owners and the company only started trading six months ago, probably just after their wedding. I tried to keep up and knew that Joey was doing his best to convey what Helen had told him. 
Helen's boyfriend told the tax office, which, by the way, will pay his bill. I was glad to hear that I wouldn't have to pay a huge bill. So, the IRS investigated Richard Walton and found out that he was on their wanted list. They had a photo of him or something like that. So he's a fraud, I said, stating the obvious. Oh, yes, Mikey, but wait until you hear what happened next, he said, teasing me. This investigation has attracted the attention of a big corporate guy from Charlotte. North Carolina, I interrupted. Yes, Joey said excitedly. His name is Davis Nolan, and he has a daughter named Julia Reed. She is currently separated from her husband, Kyle Reed. They have two children. Now I was seriously confused. Go on, Joey, I said irritably. Hold on, baby, he said, out of breath. It turned out that Kyle Reed is Richard Walton. What? I screamed into the phone, and Joey's ears must have started ringing. Not that he cared. He was too busy laughing until he cried. Yeah, and they're still legally married. I think he's called a bigamist or something, but that's not the best, he said, leaving me waiting. It was starting to sound like a script for a Hollywood movie or something. Well, the FBI got involved, and it turned out that this guy is a two-time criminal. He's already served time for controlled substances and theft, I think. Mr. Nolan helped him get a reduced sentence for his second offense. He is apparently a very influential man. Anyway, the FBI was investigating him, and Kyle Richard contacted another suspect they were looking for for trafficking in controlled substances. My thoughts went back to Jessica and her friends and family. I could imagine their faces when they heard the news. I started to smile. There's one more thing, Mikey. The FBI and the IRS teamed up and took him. They found it in a warehouse near his home, and the answer to the question of how a man in debt could afford a million-dollar home and a luxurious lifestyle became obvious. How, Joey, how? I was captured. They found controlled substances and stolen goods in his warehouse and in his truck. They thought he was going to run away again. He had suitcases in his truck with clothes and everything. I started laughing and Rachel joined me on the couch, shaking her head and laughing too. She had no idea what caused my happiness. What about Jessica? I asked and Rachel turned to me and glared. I covered the phone with my hand and whispered to her. You won't believe this, I said, shaking my head, leaving her in the dark. Joey continued talking as I returned the phone to my ear. She was arrested. Her parents somehow managed to keep it out of the press, but I think they'll be front page news in the coming days. This is big news after all he said. I think Joey was more worried than I was because, frankly, all the feelings I had for Jessica, anger or otherwise, were gone. I took Rachel's hand and held it to confirm this fact. When I finished the call, I eagerly turned to Rachel and told her everything. She was shocked and surprised because although she knew that Jessica was a complete bitch, it had never occurred to her that she could be a criminal. All I could think was what her parents family and the so-called elite of society would think. Poor daddy had criminal daughters, and that certainly wouldn't do him any favors at the country club. I had to laugh to myself and Rachel knew what I was thinking and laughed with me. Within days, the front page of every newspaper in the area and every news channel was covering the story. I think Jessica's parents still had some influence in society because she was hardly mentioned. Sure, the bigamist, the drug dealer, the fraudster was all over the screen, but the high society female face who was well known in the corporate financial world was not mentioned by name. However, less than a week passed before a newspaper published photographs of both of them with prisoner numbers but no mention of Jessica's name. We also learned that Kyle Reed is actually 41 years old, not 35 as he claimed. So my ex-wife left me for an older criminal who just ruined her life. Maybe she's not as smart as she thought. I was really shocked to see the picture of my ex-wife. I looked several times to recognize her. She looked like a shadow of the confident and arrogant woman who left me almost eight months ago. She was emaciated and seemed aged. Her hair was thinning, and there were huge dark circles under her eyes. I looked up to see my beautiful pregnant bride who looked completely different. I felt like the luckiest person in the world. Not only because I had her, 
but also because I got rid of my ex and her family. This all died down in the following months. We enjoyed our first family Christmas in our new home. Rachel's parents came to visit us, Helen and Joey stopped by, and I was surprised to see that several of my old friends from my building days had contacted me again. They loved Rachel too, and they were the ones who convinced me to get back into the construction business. Rachel and Jasmine agreed, which is another reason why I love them. In the new year, I quit my job and became a self-employed worker. I worked on construction sites, but also did small jobs in the community. Ironically, I started getting a lot of requests to do gardening work in several areas. I was even surprised by a call from Peter and Shelley, but only if I promised not to pester Shelley. They got my word. Rachel gave birth to our twins, Alex and Sophia, in March. We got married in a small ceremony in Albany in April. It's been just over a year since my divorce from Jessica, and it's amazing to think about how much has happened in that time. However, unfortunately, this was not the last time I saw her. My new ideal life was going great until one day an unexpected guest came knocking. His name was Andrew Brown of the law firm Jones & Brown, who was defending Jessica Walker in her upcoming trial. I was surprised that she went back to her maiden name. Probably mom and dad didn't want the Walker's good name to be dragged through the mud. Mr. Brown made himself comfortable in my house and began to speak. We'd like you to give a positive character statement for Jess. I mean, Miss Walker, he asked bluntly. I laughed. Why should I do this? I answered. Well, before your divorce, you knew Miss Walker best. You know that she is an honest person and has never been involved in criminal activity, right? He spoke as if he were asserting rather than asking. But even I could see where he was going. What if he refuses? A voice suddenly asked behind me. Rachel came down the stairs, obviously overhearing our conversation. Mr. Brown looked at me. What my wife said, I suggested. Well, we can issue a subpoena and force you to attend. If you still don't show up, we can prosecute you and put you in jail, he said in a threatening tone. My first reaction was to smash his face and throw him head first through the door. But looking at my wife, I realized that I had too much to lose. I had no idea whether his words were correct or legal, but for the sake of one court appearance, I agreed to his demands. It was just easier that way. So here I sit in the court waiting room. The trial had been going on for several days, and as my appearance approached, I turned to Rachel. What should I say, dear? I asked in a whisper. She took my hand and looked at me with her beautiful brown eyes and said, you are the most honest and loving person I have ever known. Just be honest. I knew that what I said in court probably wouldn't make much difference to the case. My ex-wife's legal team forced me to come. They wrongly assumed that I would talk about her in a positive light. This could have been the biggest mistake they ever made because I didn't mean to do it. A few days ago, the trial of Kyle Reed ended. He was found guilty of Class E bigamy, a federal charge of class I possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute, perjury, handling stolen property, and multiple charges related to defrauding the U.S. government. This was also his third strike. He was sentenced to 70 years in prison. I was even shocked by this verdict. However, to get a lighter sentence, he accused Jessica of fraud and possession of stolen goods. He claimed that she was involved because they started a holding company immediately after their marriage. As they say, there is no honor among thieves. The charges of possession of stolen property were disputed, but the IRS had every case for fraud. Mr. Green, we are ready for you, the bailiff announced. I stood up and exhaled loudly. Rachel left to join the audience while Jasmine watched the twins in the waiting room. They slept, not paying attention to what was happening. My name was announced in court, and when I approached the stand, I felt the eyes of the entire room on me. The atmosphere was strange. There were several cheers as I took the witness stand, especially from those sitting behind the defendant. When I took the oath, I turned to the audience, and it was the first time in a year that I saw Jessica in person. She was dressed in an orange prison uniform and flanked on both sides by an expensive defense team. She was looking at the floor but I made eye contact with her parents 
and a few friends sitting behind her. I saw several people looking at me and whispering, Wow! The irony that I was now looking down on them from the witness stand was not lost on me. Throughout our marriage they looked down on me. Now the roles have been reversed. Andrew Brown stood up and began to speak. Thank you for coming today, Mr. Green, he said. Well, they didn't leave me much choice, Mr. Brown, I answered, looking at him. He backed away from my tone and all eyes turned to him, waiting for his reaction. At this moment, Jessica finally raised her head and looked in my direction. Her eyes opened wide and her jaw dropped. She suddenly burst into tears, causing everyone to turn and look. The realization must have hit her. The man she fell in love with was back, and the man she destroyed had disappeared. Now she was inconsolable, and the judge asked her lawyer if she needed a break. He ignored the offer and continued. Mr. Green, as the defendant's ex-husband, who she said treated her well during the divorce, are you not surprised by the charges brought against her? He asked, not meeting any objections from the prosecutor. I was very shocked. But regarding the fact that I was treated well during the divorce, I, I think you and I have different ideas about what good means, I answered confidently, and a whisper was heard from behind the lawyer. I'm sure I saw Jessica's parents talking to one of the team members while Jessica herself continued to sob. Okay, Mr. Green, but would you say that during the entire time that you were together, she was always an honest, hard-working, and law-abiding citizen? He asked. Well, she cheated on me for four months with a man she described as younger, attractive, and successful, so I guess we have different ideas about honesty again, I replied. At this point, I began to think that the defense team may have made a mistake. Remember, he only threatened me to appear, but not to portray her as an ideal and innocent woman. I was just being honest, as Rachel advised. But agree that during the time you neglected yourself physically and intellectually, when someone better came along, could you really blame the defendant for leaving? He said irritably. Almost in unison, indignant exclamations were heard from the spectators and from the accuser, who clearly felt that at this moment his participation was not needed. The defense dug a hole for itself. The judge cleared the air, giving me time to think about my answer. I agree that I neglected aspects of my life. It's hard to live with someone who controls your life and whose family and friends consider you inferior to them. The defendant's father once called me a handsome fool, I said openly, and the expressions of shock and bewilderment among the defense attorneys were almost too funny for words. At this moment, Jessica simply looked at me with pity in her eyes. I didn't have a single drop of pity for her in return. Perhaps, Mr. Green, but there is no evidence that the defendant was ever involved in criminal activity, no evidence that in all the years that you were together, she was dishonest or intended to commit fraud. She paid her bills, even yours for a time, and never broke the law. This is true, he said, now clearly confused. Objection. The prosecutor stood up. This is unacceptable, your honor. The witness does not have to prove the defendant's innocence. This is a waste of the court's time. I support, said the judge. The defense can reformulate the question. Mr. Brown looked puzzled, but cleared his throat and continued his questioning. Mr. Green, during the years that you were together, the defendant was an honest person who paid her bills, taxes, and mortgage. She even paid yours for a while, right? He said. Yes, I said. But I don't know what she has become over the past year. Well, I think you can guess, I said. Objection, said Mr. Brown, turning to the judge. What do you mean by objection, Mr. Brown? He's your witness, said the judge, trying not to laugh, while half the court burst into laughter. The jury should have looked away. Your Honor, he is clearly a resentful ex-husband who wants revenge on the woman who left him and moved on, he said, now clearly irritated and angry. The defense team was now beside themselves with worry. Jessica looked between her parents and her lawyers with tears in her eyes. Your Honor, if he is an angry ex-husband, why did you call him? The judge asked without hiding his smile, and the whole room laughed again. The jury turned away. Is it true that you are truly an angry person who wants to see his ex-wife suffer? Mr. Brown asked after a pause. 
If this had happened eleven months ago, perhaps you would have had a reason. But now I have no reason to be angry. I may not be the smartest person, Your Honor, but I am an honest person. Please, Mr. Green, your wife. Ex-wife, Mr. Brown, I interrupted him. Well, your ex-wife left you for another man, and you do not feel anger and resentment towards her and her family? He asked. No, like I said, eleven months ago, maybe you could have guessed it. But since then I have found the most beautiful woman in the world, I said, looking towards the audience seats directly at Rachel. People followed my gaze until all eyes were on her. She lifted me up, put me back together, and now I call her my wife. She gave me three beautiful children. We have wonderful friends, a wonderful family, a beautiful home, and a successful business. Who in the world will be offended by all this? I said, looking at my beautiful wife without looking away, the smile did not leave my lips. She just looked at me with the same joyful smile, nodding her head. I turned back to see the tense faces of the defenders and Jessica's now depressed parents, who looked down at their hands. Jessica looked devastated and caught my eye as she sobbed. I whispered the words, thank you, to her, and she collapsed on the table, sobbing. I was released and returned to my family. As I was leaving the hall, I heard noise associated with Jessica in the spotlight. She screamed, sorry, I love you, but I didn't know if it was directed at me and honestly, I didn't care. Jessica was found guilty of conspiracy to defraud the U.S. government. I think the court felt that Kyle Reed wasn't smart enough to do it alone. I learned that the titles were 18371, 26, 7 and 201, and 7 and 206, 1 and 2. I had no idea what that meant. She was also found guilty of fifth-degree possession of stolen property, a class of felony. She was sentenced to six years in prison. It also meant that any possibility of her continuing her career in the financial world after her release was forever lost. As far as we are concerned, life is wonderful. Geminis grow up every day, and their smiles can clear the clouds even on the darkest day, which, fortunately, rarely happens. My business is booming, and even Rachel now has several clients who come to our home for hair and beauty treatments. Jasmine is successfully completing her final year of college, which I am now paying for, by the way. Well, it was the least I could do for her, because she saved my life, remember? Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one.